Okay, last but not least, I would like to introduce Professor Tony Oro. Um, Tony is a professor in the Department of Dermatology, he has a strong interest in cancer, and, but also has a strong interest in bringing stem cell therapy to cure genetic diseases of the skin, blistering diseases. He is also a member of the Stem Cell Institute and of the Cancer Institute, and without further ado, Tony. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm the last one before lunch, so I'll be as quickly as possible. But thank you very much for the organizers for um, having me talk about um, our um, program here called Therapeutic Reprogramming. And just to get it started, um, there's been really th two major ways that we've done um, medicine in the past. One is surgical, you can cut it out. Um, and the second way is to get a drug and give it to the patient. But what happens as we've talked about today, what Dr. Andrews, Dr. Rosenthal, and all our speakers have talked about, if you have a diseased organ, which you cannot cut out because you need it, um, and you can't give it a drug because it's not druggable. And so, and those are things, for example, genetic skin diseases like monogenic diseases, um, and other things which we'll talk about more. And that's where things like therapeutic reprogramming, where you can take the organ and put it back in or regenerate it, becomes the third arm of medicine. We'll talk, all of the speakers today have talked about. What I wanted to do really is to then sort of summate all that we've talked about in the last few talks um, in this therapeutic reprogramming effort we have here at Stanford. Um, the disease we're talking about is a monogenic disease, as, as Martin had talked about, because it's, again, a very specific type of therapy, which then you can learn a lot of and then apply it to more general principle. And epidermolysis spilosa, which um, uh, is a, um, a very, uh, uh, these patients are very unfortunate, is a monogenic disease. We're here on the right, we're one of 12 proteins that keeps your epidermis stuck to your dermis um, are missing. And so any trauma, or in these cases, these kids that come out, in the birth canal, um, and your skin comes off like a glove. And then for the rest of their life, um, they are, um, have wounds and uh, like burn patients, and there's really um, no, up to date, no, no current therapy. And so these patients have, as you see here, a lifetime of palliation, where they um, are wrapped like mummies uh, with nothing else to do. And so here's an example where if we could develop a therapy where we can put this organ back, and the organ in this case is the skin, um, with a corrected gene, we've been, we then can prevent them from having a lifetime of being wrapped like a mummy, and then if they do live until their age 20, they basically develop squamous cell carcinoma because it's a chronic wounding. Um, this is not a life that we, and we have a chance now with the current therapies that we've talked about here in this group to actually try this therapy for, on these patients um, and see if we then prevent them from getting um, chronic wounding and squamous cell carcinoma. And so um, we know this has done a over 20 years here at Stanford, where we can take somatic skin cells, shown here, a little biopsy, put it in a dish, and then take a retrovirus with the gene, for example, collagen 7, put it back in the skin, and then graft it on the patient. This has been worked on first by Gene Bauer in our, in our department, and then multiple people over the last 20 years, and now we're doing phase one clinical trials here at Stanford to show that these grafts can actually completely correct um, the, the blistering condition in these skins. This is an amazing achievement, um, led by Zurab Sifrafili, uh, Paul Kavari, Peter, Peter Rankovich, and Alain in our department, um, and really is, is a wonderful achievement that, this po that if you can get the corrected stem cell and put it back on, it will actually then have long-term, like years and years of corrected therapy uh, with this retrovirus. Now, there's some, serious, there's some problems with this approach. And that is that these stem cells are hard to come by, so if you wanted to actually have unlimited quantities of organs of, to, to spread all over your body, um, you can't do it because you can't expand them enough with a retrovirus. Moreover, um, the, the retrovirus that's expressing the gene um, will, will poop out after a while, and so then it'll stop making the protein. So what you want is an approach like Matt Portius just talked about, where you can just do, do homologous recombination and correct the disease. Um, and then there's also the need for not just for make skin, but if you had personalized IPS cells with the correction in it, then you could make not just skin, but in theory, any personalized organ if you had the recipe to make it. And so what I wanted to talk about in the next six minutes is an approach called therapeutic reprogramming where we've done this um, in, um, uh, uh, and grafted the skin onto animals, but really to think about, um, in terms of what Martin Andrews talked about, how do you manufacture this? What's, and what are the, the key problems that we need to address going forward? And so these requirements then for therapeutic reprogramming to take an uh, 
IP, a corrected personalized IPS cell manufactured into an organ such as skin requires the ability to generate clinical grade personalized embryonic stem cell like cells, the IPS cells, that you can expand indefinitely. You need to be able to edit the genome in a, in a um, uh, scalable clinical way. Um, and then you also need to differentiate these IPS cells, you have the recipe, into the organ that you want, the functional organ, for, the, for example, in the heart, um, as Sean talked about. Um, but, and then as also as Nadia talked about, you need to transplant in this, this organ incorporate it into the, the, the functional adult um, in, a, in an efficient way. Um, and these are all um, blockade and, and other things we need to overcome to get this to work. And so um, in this therapy group probing for epidermolysis bullosa, sort of diagrammed here, you can see that we've attempted to do this by taking skin biopsies, reprogramming them into personalized iPS cells for our EB patients, um, using, um, in this case, AAV, as a Hamas recombination tool, because it's more scalable, um, to correct um, the genetic defects for collagen 7, and then um, taking individual clones um, uh, of that have been corrected, and then um, sequencing them individually to see which ones are the low-risk clones um, that have the least amount of, um, of mutations um, that have been either from, starting from the patient or before, and then differentiating them into a functional organ and grafting them onto, in this case, a mouse, to prove in terms of um, function that we have a fully functional skin. And this is sort of the program we're trying to develop here at Stanford. I just want to walk you through some of the problems and the, the successes we've had. So um, we've already talked about this, um, the making IPS cells, and so I'm just going to skip over this. But really we can make, we use a scalable program where you have a excisable lentivirus, where you can, with the reprogramming factors to make the induced pluripotent cells. We do this because then you can cut out the, the little virus and then leave just a little scar um, for, um, for, and also it's scalable. Um, getting back to the issue that we need scalability and clinical grade components so we can do this in a GMP fashion. And so here you can see we can easily make these um, IPS cells. Now the question is not just, um, uh, the next step is homologous recombination that Matt talked about. And he talked about a number of different ways. When we first started this, this project, it was not, it, they told us we could not do homologous recombination in humans. And now the question is not, can you do it? But it's which technique is, is the best? And there's, there's a whole debate, which you can talk about up here with our um, speakers. But really, um, we use this adeno-associated virus because it, you can actually make it in a clinical-grade fashion, um, and you can scale it. Um, and so you can do that. And here, I'll just skip over this as well because of time. But um, uh, you can then edit those, those IPS cells. Now, one of the big issues here is, is safety. And that is that when you have these, you make these IPS cells for the patient, how do you know they're going to be safe? And so safety is a huge issue. And so the nice thing about the IPS cells is they can take individual clones of corrected that for per that person and then sequence all of them, figure out where the low risk clones are, pick those out and then manufacture them. And so you can do that by, um, I work on skin cancer, so we can then look at the genes here that are causing a skin cancer. And you can take these three individual clones here in the, the, um, that you see in black, uh, look at their different uh, sets of mutations and variants that they've either had or we've incorporated into them, pick the low risk one, which in this case is on the left, um, and then use that for downstream effects. This is going to be very helpful for safety. And because you have a clone that can actually is a single cell derivative, then you can then expand that and then use that for downstream components. Now the question is, how do you get the, the organ that you want? And here you need to be um, the iron chef, because what you need is ability to find the right manufacturing con conditions on the right components to manufacture and get skin and epithelial grafts that are corrected for the patient. And um, Sean mentioned how you, how you can make heart cells. And in, in similar ways, our group has made um, skin grafts. Um, so then you can see here above below, they have these beautiful keratinocytes that by a microanalysis look very similar to the original patient keratinocytes, except what they have is um, they make this, the one missing protein that keeps the skin, the epidermis, on its skin. And then on the left here, you can see that there's the green line where the arrows are is the collagen 7 protein that is now made fully functional and can bind to the protein keeping the skin on when the, when the patient um, hits the door walking out the door. Um, the last thing is, can you then take this epidermis that you can make and then show that you can incorporate it into the organ um, of, on the animal? That is, in this case, um, putting in, taking the skin graft, putting it onto the animal and see if it'll last for multiple weeks. And indeed, we can do that. 
Here you can see that this is, um, then we take the, the graphs, put them onto an immunocompromised mice, and then watch and see if, they, if it sticks. If it's like the original um, uncorrected patient cell, it'll just fly off because mice are biting each other and hitting the cages, and so any trauma at all will just, the, the, the uncorrected epidermis will just fly off. However, in these cases, you can see that this, these are beautiful graphs that can stay on um, for at least three weeks um, to sort of document that we can do this in a, in a uh, manufacturing and scalable way. Okay, just so to, and then now we're just moving this into our new cell facility that Matt mentioned here at Stanford, where we can then manufacture um, these types of tissues um, in, um, here at Stanford. So finally, as we go move toward the, um, the question and answer period, uh, I want to just want to to put this into your mind. That is, there's an unlimited source of our personalized tissue from these iPS cells. We can correct monogenic diseases. We need to do this in a, in a again, a GMP and scalable way. But also, how we then, t more common diseases, um, where you can find genetic diseases and modify them, such as cholesterol or metabolic diseases, or even um, long-term things like Huntington's, where we can actually, where we're gonna have later on. And lastly, we need to talk about, in the sa is about safety issues and how to overcome them in the future. So with that, I'll stop, and thank you very much for your attention.